All right, cool. All right, so if we take a look at 512, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Auto exhaust and lead exposure. So researchers interested in lead exposure due to car exhaust sampled the blood of, blood of 52 police officers subject to constant inhalation of automobile exhaust fumes while working traffic enforcement in a primarily urban environment. The blood samples these officers had an average lead concentration of 124.32 micrograms per liter and a standard deviation of 37.74 micrograms per liter. In a previous study of individuals from a nearby suburb with no history of exposure found an average blood level concentration of 35 micrograms per liter. And then the 36 here, that's just the reference, so we don't need that. Is that the sample size? No, no, the sample size uh, was, was, was um, 52, 52. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's, that's just the, I just cut and pasted out of the book. That's the link to footnote 36. Oh, okay. Is all that was, okay. So in part A here, they want us to write down the hypotheses that would be appropriate for testing. And I wrote it down, or I wrote it to the, what I thought it was, and I put okay. what was, uh, the, I put the null as uh, mu equals one 124.32 UGL. Okay, so, so hang on, let, let, let's talk about that for a moment, okay? So what we're looking to show is that the police officers are different than the general public, right? Mm -hmm. So their exposure is causing an increase in the lead, lead the micrograms of lead in their blood, right? Yeah. Okay, so who would be the general population? Would they be the 124.32 micrograms or would they be the 35 micrograms? Uh, the 35 micrograms. Yeah. So just remember what the null is saying is that, that these folks are no different than the general population. Oh, okay. So that means that they would have 33 or 35, excuse me, micrograms per liter, just like the general population. So oh. in, in, in English, that would say that there is no diff in, in lead content in their blood, right? Like the U diff, like the book was saying? Uh, yeah, you can, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, you can think about it as mu difference, but this is a little, we're, we're, that's getting a little ahead of us. That's, uh, that's what we're doing. Um, a pair of t-tests, but let's we'll come back to that, okay? So, but there's okay. no difference in lead content in the blood of the police officers. And so we'll just call, let's just do PO for police officers, okay? Sounds good. Okay, in police officers versus the general public. All right. That's really what the null is saying. And so what that would mean is that the average blood level um, excuse me, the blood concentration of lead in the general public is going to be the same as it is for the police officers. So this mu right here, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the mu right here is for the police officers. So that's the average concentration for the police, for the police, huh? police officers. That's the population we're testing as police officers. Oh, so we're not testing for other people? No, it's just that you're, you're, the researcher is trying to determine whether or not the police officers differ from the general public, right? And so yeah. what they're saying is, okay, if we take the population of the police officers, that's, that's this mu right here. That's, that, that's them folk. That's the police officers, okay? So that population, this mu right here, this mu right here, the same thing. And that's the population average concentration for police officers of, of, of lead in their blood. Oh, all right. I had it the other way around in my brain. I was, I was. Well, it's it's not it's not a simple thing, and that's why I, if you notice, I keep asking this question over and over because eventually it's hopefully going to make sense. You know, like what is the null? What is the alternate? We get that in our discussion questions quite a bit, and it's not uh, always a straightforward you know thing to come up with. But the the t thing to remember is that the researcher for the alternate hypotheses, right? Mm -hmm. they're looking at uh, a particular population. In this case, our population, that is going to be the police officers, isn't it, right? We're talking oh, about police officers here. Okay, yeah. I, I, only said, I only said, oh, because now it's like clicking, like now the calculations are a lot more simpler. Why, why they, make, they make sense the way they go, right? 
Okay, yeah. so mu, what, what our researcher suspects is that the, the blood concentration, the population blood concentration of the police officers, that that value is actually greater than it is for the general population, oh, okay. 35 micrograms per liter. So that, that's, all of that is really important stuff because what that does is by getting the alternate hypothesis set up correctly and with all the proper numbers in there, it gives us the distribution of the null hypotheses and, mm -hmm. and, and also gives us the direction of extreme. So one way of thinking about this is that the null, what the null gives us is the distribution that we're gonna be testing our hypothesis in, okay? So the distribution of HO is given really by this statement. It's telling us that the mean is equal to 35 micrograms per liter. The alternate. Oh, it's, an M, not a, it's an M, not a U, because the book has it as some weird looking uh, hang on, let me font. Uh, hang on, let me go over to the book. Let's see. Because I have it as U, G, L. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a mu. Oh, <laughs> It's a mu. It's uh, a mu for micrograms. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Why. That Greek letter gets used in a lot of different places. So, okay. Well, so, can, but can... but key key thing, a key point that you want to keep straight is that the alternate hypotheses that gives us the direction of extreme. So, like an outlier. No, it tells us which way we're going to calculate our p value. Oh, so in this case, it'd be. One minus, uh, oh wait, we're, we're yeah, one minus good. PT. Yeah, but you get way ahead of us there. Yeah. <laughs> you are Sorry. right, Damien, but that's we'll, we'll, we'll a little bit there. We want to we want to talk about it in terms of the distribution first. So yeah, no, the distribution I, that the null purports that we can go in and test our hypothesis in is this T distribution right here. That's going to have degrees of freedom equal to fifty two minus one, right, or fifty one yeah okay and that's centered at zero all right where zero is is 35 when if you go in oh, okay yeah. set it up okay let me i'm gonna get a fresh screen here just so i want to do something real quick for a second i was like why didn't you put zero but then i forgot that 35 is zero is the zero in the t distribution so the thing you got to remember back in back in the day is that z <laughs> was equal to what x minus, minus mu divided by sigma, sigma right yeah. okay then we upgraded it using the clt the central limit theorem mm -hmm. and no. said that z was equal to x bar minus mu of the mm -hmm. x bars divided by um S, S right. over the square root of n, right? Yeah, and it's not uh, x bar minus the mu null because I was I watched. That, the... Yes, yeah, the mu null is is the x bar um, mu of the x bar. So okay, but that that's that's this is just the generalized version of it. But when you're working in a hypothesis test, you're correct. It is mu uh, null, or so you can call it mu sub zero. Okay. That, well, uh, let me go ahead and do that. If that if that makes it clear, because that's fine. It's more specific putting the mu zero in there, but that's. I just specific. remembered it from the video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's how we're using it. So let's do it that way. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then we said, okay, what if you had a small sample? That's that less than that, thirty, that, right? Well, yeah, that was a little thing I gave you about um, William Gosset that I was hoping everybody was going to read at the header of this thing. Okay. So small sample would be. Like you say, you got an N equal to say six or something like that, all right? Yeah. Yeah, well the CLT works still provided that this distribution you were sampling from in the first place was approximately normal. It doesn't matter the sample size. The CLT is happy to tell you that the distribution of your test statistics is gonna be normally distributed no matter what the sample size is if the distribution you're sampling from happens to be normal to begin with, okay? Okay. But so for small sample size, though, we switched over to T. And we yeah, said for T, well, hey, look, it was the exact same formula, wasn't it? Yeah. It, it was not change the formula at all. I still wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. It's just if the sample size is small, right? You that, use T and then C. Right. And, and in the, we talked about it, the heavy tail idea. If the black one here 
if that's z, in other words, that's n of zero by one, right? Yeah. Okay. Then if say you got an n equal to six in the t distribution, then the t distribution is going to look not quite unlike but similar to but that. It's gonna, it's gonna have fatter tails, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's t with your degrees of freedom equal to five. Good job about the heavy tails, because that, that's an important thing to remember. All right, so, but <clears throat> here's the thing that, that the central limit theorem gives us. It says that as n gets really big, t goes to z. There's no difference between them. And that's when they get bigger? When n gets bigger. Or n, I'm sorry, I meant to say n. Yeah, you get a big sample size. And, and really, to tell you the truth, it says n approaches 30. You don't even have to go out to infinity. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't take much more than 30 because the central limit theorem kicks in about then, and you're pretty much guaranteed that that distribution is going to be um, happy, okay? Yeah. Right, so let's, go, let's go back to the problem at hand, all right, with that quick review. So okay. this, this distribution right here is a t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to 51. Mm -hmm. We can do calculation in z, and we would get basically the same number. They're, they're, they're pretty much the same at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. But... That said, we're gonna to have to go find out what our observed T statistic is, which I've been calling TOBS for T observed, right? Oh, T dot OBS. Yeah. And once we figured out what that is, right, then mm -hmm. this shaded region to the right of it is gonna end up being our P value. And then we do the test like we did in the lab, right? Yeah, well, we don't, we don't need uh, well, in fact, we can't use the like the test like we did in the lab because our studio, well, in R, I should say, not our studio, R is designed to be used in the real world. And in the real world, you have the raw data. We didn't get the raw data here. It's a textbook problem. All they gave us yeah. was the summary statistics. They just gave us X bar, S, and the sample size, and what the purported population mean is. In other words, they gave us summary numbers, but oh. they didn't give us the data. So uh, we're not I, able to use the t-dot test when you're just given summary numbers. It doesn't work. Wait, so okay. the 124 is not the sample mean? That is the sample mean. It totally is. But we don't have the 52 measurements from the police officers. And if you want to use t-dot test in, in R, right? Mm -hmm. t-dot test, it needs data. It can't have summary stats. It, oh. does, it doesn't work with summary statistics. So only if you have the complete pie. You got it. You need the data set or it's not going to work. It's, it's assuming you're going to put the numbers in. Yeah. So that's why the, the lab, that question the, the on your own, why it blew up is because I, I couldn't give you the numbers. <laughs> yeah, for some reason. You're supposed I to read them in. I... Uh, Damien, I'm pulling my hair out trying to figure out why it's not working. I got to go talk to somebody. I, I was going to do it today, but I didn't get a chance to figure out why it's not working. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm punting because it's working on some folks' computers and it's not working on others, which is really frustrating. So I'm going to punt and just put the numbers into the lab for the next time I do it. But that should work. Being able to read things in from URL is one of the beauties of of R. So I, 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 I don't want to lose that, that functionality. But let, let's stay focused on this. Let's go ahead and get that yeah. one done, okay? All right, so we know that our observed T statistics, so our T observed here, is going to be equal to X bar minus mu, mu. divided by, and that's mu sub zero, right? Divided yeah. by S over the square root of N. But we got to back up because notice that B, part B up here, says you need to check your assumptions before you can start calculating that t observed. And then I put for that, but I basically went to my reference book and I said they are less than 10% yep. of, the, of the population, Perfect. which is independence and the observ or which is stated as independence and observations come from a nearly normal distribution. Yeah. You have no reason to assume that they would not be normally distributed and the sample size is large enough that the CLT is going to kick in anyway. And so you're. Do I need to put the sample size part in there? No, no, you don't. I mean, it's, there's no reason to us here that you would think that this was horribly skewed. And even if it was marginally skewed, since the sample size is big enough, the CLT um, would, would take care of that for us. Okay. 
Okay. But what, you, what you've written is fine, but we do need to consider that, okay? So I, I just quickly yeah. wrote down, it's less than 10%. We can, I'm just really briefly here, we can assume normal, all right? But we do okay. we need to address those. So when I, when I wrote it up, I wrote, put a little more verbiage in that, but that's basically what you Yeah, need. you said explicitly, so I answered explicitly. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I typed it up a little more. Um, than that. Okay, so now we're ready to actually go in and put the numbers in. So let me come back over to that blank sheet because that's going to be a little easier to do it on. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of this R code that I had. I was like, before you were able to help me, I was like trying all my my dingness to like try and figure it out myself, and it it was not looking like it. <laughs> well, it's this is just it's just we do it exactly how they show in the book. There's no um, no crazy um, t dot tests magic here happening in this one okay okay all right so here we go so you help me out now you get to read some numbers for me what was the sample mean what was that 124.32 let me double check that before i uh, yeah 124.32 okay uh, i'll put the units here that's some micrograms per liter and what about the standard deviation what you get for that 37.74 and then the units you the mu gl thing right exactly okay and then our sample size we know that that was equal to 52 right 52 yeah and then the null hypothesis reports that it is 35 right 35 micrograms per liter okay all right so we're going to plug all of these numbers over here into and this is going to give us back our t observed once we do that so okay so parentheses i'm going to i'm going to write it down as if i was typing in an r okay yeah um 24 point i'm just gonna have to listen to you because when i switch over to r it takes the whole window yeah no, we'll, we'll go over there in a minute we're gonna write it down here yeah. first i always oh. like you write it down first then you go over to r yeah because i i tend to make mistakes if i don't do that and then divide i remember and another I open a parentheses yeah. for the denominator and yeah so that's going to be what um the 37.74 right and then this, yeah, then divided by the square root of the uh, 52. Right, so SQ RT 52. RT of 52, close parentheses, close parentheses, okay? Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be our TOBS or our T observe. So let's go over and do that in our studio, okay? Okay. Um, yeah. So anticipating that I was going to be doing this with you, I already typed it in. <laughs> oh, so I, I got to. I'll let you catch up. No worries. Yeah, no, I was I, okay. Well, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get this done. Uh, I was working on trying to get it done and post it for you before the office hour, and that didn't happen. So, so I put do I put t dot obs before I put all that in? That is your call. I do that to store it. I like to have that number where I can get to it. T dot obs. I recommend you store it into something. So tobs is a great. T dot obs means T observe, or you can call it tobs or whatever you'd like to call it. As a, so I do T dot obs equals and then yes. that whole thing. Right. And what that does is it stores that result into um, into tobs for us. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, probably what I should have done, what I didn't do is make it echo that too. So I'm going to put a tobs in here. Uh, darn! My it made the window really small, so I, I gotta like try and find out how to make it big again. Cause now okay. I'm like, yeah, oh. no worries. I have, I have, we have time. I mean, I think this you're the only question I've got so far tonight. Nobody else asked anything, so it's kind of sad. <laughs> well, you know what happens is a lot of people unfortunately take an online class because their schedules are just ridiculous, and so they do it so that they can try and do all of the work. You know, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or in some folks' case, they try and do it all on Sunday. You know, and it's yeah. it's you know, this is a, a four unit class that meets three days a week. So that's like trying to do a week's worth of work in one day. You know, and that it's just brutal. And then they wonder why they struggle trying to get things done. It's just way too much work to do all in one day. Hi, Christina. Or yeah, or no, not Catherine. Catherine, yeah. sorry. I okay. Catherine, are you there, Catherine? I am. How are you? Oh, uh, pretty good. Good. Uh, I'm almost there. Five twelve. I'm home. almost there. Oh, come on, junk. Oh, there we go. Exit minimize video. Hooray! 
Divided by, okay, I'm almost there. Divided by okay, three. great. I'm going to go catch Catherine up real quick on what we were talking about, okay? Okay, that sounds great. So, Catherine, this is the one, um, I don't know if you got to it yet. This is 512 from the homework. It's the oh, good. exposure for police officers. Good. It's evil. <laughs> I know it is. That's a great yes, exposure to lead is evil. I agree. <laughs> Not necessarily this problem is evil, but especially this motion. Okay. I was gonna say you're putting words in my mouth. I was not. Not. No. Not, not wasn't me. So, okay. There we go. Okay. So no, I'm gonna let me back up, Damien. I'm gonna make sure Catherine's caught up to. Yeah. No. Right. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So, so we we're basically we did the first part. We wrote down the the null and the alternate hypotheses, and basically in in English. What, what the null says is that these police officers that are, you know, breathing, inhaling automobile exhausts right. all the time, that the average lead content in their blood is no difference. There's no difference between that hey, and my, in the general public. Uh, he's going to, hey, my dinner's done, so I, I got to go eat, but um, this it's, will I'm be recording it. You'll, I'll show you the right. You just log in after you get done. Uh, Damien and it should be posted. It takes about an hour or two for me to get it posted because it's got to save it and all this crazy stuff. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. So Catherine, I'm going to back up. This is me and you. We'll get caught up and then I will finish it off with you. Okay. Sounds okay. excellent. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So the, um, the main, the main point with the null is that it's talking about the population blood level of lead in the police officers. Yes. So that's what our researchers are doing, okay? And yeah. they're saying that it's bigger than, than it is for the general public. Yes. So the null hypothesis would say, well, no, there's no difference between the police officers' lead content in their blood than there is for the general public. So that means the police officers' mean is 35 micrograms per liter. Right, 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 right. Researcher says, oh, no, I can't try. It is, it is greater than 35 micrograms per liter, okay? It's bigger than that. that so once we got that, we're stoked because we got two things that came from that. We got the distribution of the null. So that's what's over here. That's our null distribution right there. And we also got the direction of extreme. So the alternate hypotheses, when we look at that inequality symbol, it gives us an arrowhead that tells us the direction of extreme. So we know this is a one-tailed test to the right. That's, that's a really nice trick, is that if you look at this inequality symbol right here, it's pointing to the right, which means we're one-tailed to the right. Another way of thinking about it, I mean, you know, which is in many ways more satisfying, is that you're saying that the mean, the actual population mean, is not here, but it's to the right of it. It's, it's over to the other side of it. It's bigger than that which means it would be to the right of zero because zero means that there, you don't have any disagreement that you have the same population name. Okay, so then um, I'm gonna take you over just our studio. We, we have to explicitly state and check all the conditions necessary for inference in this data before we go any further. So there really are only two things we gotta talk about. The first one is we gotta talk something about independence, all right? We gotta assume that we, our sample size is such that it's not taking more than 10% of the population. And so 52 officers, we're talking about the population of police officers, that's probably gonna be quite a bit less than 10%. So that's, that's a safe assumption. So we got that part. And then the second one is, well, the sample size is greater than 30, so we don't really need to be too concerned about the original population being normally distributed. But that said, we don't really have any reason to suspect that the distribution of lead among the police officers would be horribly skewed one direction or the other. Um, the mean and the standard deviation, the ratio of those two isn't too bad. That's one of the ways that they look at it is they look at these numbers here and say, well, the standard deviation was 37, the mean was 124. That means that there's not a huge amount of variability in the distribution with respect to the mean. So safe bet that both the assumptions are made. Okay. You good with that? Can we, can we roll with that or you got questions on that part? Um, well, I, one thing that does occur to me, mm -hmm. like, 
something that I've, I think I've always kind of struggled with. Um, how small is small? Less than 30. So I guess, I guess when talking about something like standard deviation. Or, oh, you mean size of standard deviation. Or the, the P value. Okay, well, let's take them one at a time because those are, those are okay. they're different beasts, okay? So let, let's say, let's just talk about standard deviation for a moment, okay? Okay. All right, so if you wanted to know when is the standard deviation relatively small, like in our case right now, it's what, 124.32 for, for X bar. Okay. Right? So let, let's just round it off, say 124, okay? So our sample mean is 124. Our sample standard deviation is, again, let's round out, say 38. Okay, so there is um, a way of looking at this where you simply take the mean, right? Take X bar and divide that by S. Yes. Take 124 and divide that by 38. And if that number is greater, significantly greater, and the way they do this with double whammy greater equal signs than one, then you feel good about what's going on, all right? It means if you think about the distribution, if it was normally distributed, let's make that assumption just for a moment, okay? If it was normally distributed, then by the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, here's our 124. Let's see, 124 plus 38 is, roughly 164, right? Kind of, if I round that up to 40, right? Just to make my life really easy. And then down this way is gonna be like 90 something, right? And so this distance right here, the one standard deviation is less than a mean. It's quite a bit less than a mean. It's about three times less than a mean. So that does, what that infers to us is that there's not a huge amount of spread in the distribution with respect to the size of the number that we're working with. Okay. So that, that's a good way to take a look at it to start with. It's, um, if, you, if you think about it with, uh, let's say heights, okay? If, if we had heights and we said that, you know, the mean height, maybe because maybe it'll make more sense, because it's a little more, you know, tactile, something you get more experience with. Yeah. We said the mean height was, say, equal to 69 inches, right? And the standard deviation was equal to 2 inches. Then that means that on average, right, what we would suspect if we could do the, the two standard deviation rule, well, it's going to be, what, 69, 70, 71 inches? And then if I subtract 2 from that down to, what, 67 inches? Yeah. And so, let me move that over here a little bit. So that tells me that about 95% of my heights are gonna fall within those two numbers, aren't they, right? Okay. Okay, now that tells me that what, looks like 67 to 69 to 71, there's not a huge amount of variation in the heights, is there? Yeah, right. You know, they're, everybody's pretty close, right? Okay, so let's change it up. Let's say that we go to a different country. Say we go to Russia um, outside of Chernobyl, okay? And there's been some weird stuff happening there because of the, the spillage from the nuclear power plant, all right? Right. Okay, and now all of a sudden, let's say sigma is equal to 40 inches or, or S, right? Um, hang on just a second. I apologize. I made a tactical error here, Catherine. My, I was get, so used because we were talking about hypothesis testing, I got used to just writing down mu. Oh, My oh. Bad. Minus a million points. We didn't see that. I did. I caught it finally. <laughs> At least I caught it before I saved this. <laughs> All right. But anyway, that's fine. These are, these are sample numbers. We're going to assume that these sample numbers are very good. I'll put, I'll put the dot above the equal signs that these are very good estimates of mu and sigma. Okay. And so that I can use them to draw my pictures. All right. Okay. Yeah. So if I assume that those are very good estimates of mu and sigma, now take a look at this distribution, all right? So again, we're centered at 69, but S is 40 inches. 
And so to get out to 95% this time, I got to go up to 109 inches, right? And I got to go down to 29 inches. Okay. So there is a huge amount of variability in this distribution, isn't there, right? Yeah. And so when that happens, that also really messes with the shape. I'm not so sure that that's bell-shaped anymore, right? At least for smaller sample sizes, because it's gonna be all over the place when the sample size is small. Even if it really is bell-shaped normal, when I go with a smaller sample size, man, I'm gonna get somebody who's 35 inches, and the next person I'm gonna get is gonna be 89 inches, you with me? Yeah. My data's gonna be crazy, it's gonna be all over the place. Where up here, right, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm happy to climb at a bake, right? Because I pick, I pick somebody, I know they're going to be around somewhere between 67 to 71 inches. That's not a huge interval, is it? Okay. So is that helping a little bit? Yeah, I think it does. Okay, good. All right, so let's go, let's go back to the regular scheduled program then. Let's go back to our, what we were working with here, right? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to run with that B, we're gonna put a check mark here, okay? Boom, we, we, we did that, all right? Sound good? Cool. All right, now they want us to test the hypotheses for the downtown police officers have a higher lead exposure than the group in the previous study interpret results in context. So what that means is, is that I need to calculate the observed test statistic, which is a T stat, and then I need to calculate the corresponding P value that goes with that, that, that observed test statistic. So to do yeah. that, I need this formula right here. It's really the exact same formula we used earlier when we were talking about the central limit theorem. If you wanna do a Z-score with the central limit theorem, that's, that's the formula that you would use. Z and T are kissing cousins. They're really doing the same thing. They're measuring how far your sample mean is away from the hypothesized mean in units of standard error. Um. Another question about that, mm -hmm. in the book, uh, where did the book go? That's great. Um, in the book, I saw a formula for... Can you give me a page was, number? If I can find my book, one second. Okay. So page 235? Yes. All right. Okay, I'm almost there. I'm on page 230, 234, 235, okay. All right, so yeah, there we go. There's the T-score. Is that the one you're talking about, the one that's on example 5.21? Yeah, and I was looking for the, the formula that you just, um, wrote, mm -hmm. but I found this, this instead. And so I was kind of, <laughs> I was really confused about the Well, difference. because they didn't show their work. That was mean of them. It, the well, I think what threw me off was that they didn't put a square root sign. I mean, Oh, I see what you mean by not showing their work. Yeah, they did. They just did the calculation. That's why the square root sign is not there. They've already used it. Okay. So this is for a paired t-test. but The paired t-test um, test statistic is identical for a single mean because what you're doing is you're just going to go make a single mean by finding the differences between the before and the after. Yeah, okay. Hey, so where? what page is the... It's just the, the formula that you wrote on the whiteboard. Oh, I got to scroll back up. It's going to be like in the 20s, in the, in the previous section here, before paired data. So let's back up. Scrolling up. Is it close to the beginning of the, the chapter? Yes. It's one of the first things they do as soon as they come out, they talk about the T distribution. That would make sense. 
but I couldn't find it when I was looking. No, I'm coming closer here. I'm smelling it. <laughs> Introducing the T distribution. Oh, maybe it's in the pre. Oh, that's a good point. You know, Catherine, I'm going to wonder where it's at myself now. I mean, I found that I found that exact formula online when I. No, I know, but it should be right here, someplace in a box in the yeah. room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we use this thing so much. And so the difference between what I was seeing in the book and what I was seeing online really confused me. Yeah, well, the paired stuff. T test, hang on, I'm, I'm going back through it again, see if I can find it. Score. Ah, well, okay, it's kind of weak, but they, they tell you on page um, 227. That it's exactly the same as the z-score. Yeah, right. I saw that. Yeah, so, but it would have been really nice if they had actually reiterated the formula at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a weak sauce. I, I didn't notice that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, well, uh, I do show it in the videos. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's um, let's finish this bad boy off, okay? Let's yeah, finish. yeah, sorry. That's all right, let's get this one done. No, it's okay, that was a good comment. I'm glad you said something to me about it, but... Um, it is, I mean, I just, Damien and I were just talking about that, that it is no different than, than the z-score, okay? So let's go do the calculation. We, we, we can get this thing going here. Let's see. So if we do the calculation, let's go ahead and kill this. So we know that our T observes, so Catherine, you're going to have to help me out here a bit again, one more time. That's going to be my x-bar minus mu sub zero over s divided by the square root of n. And so the x bar was equal to what, 127 point what? Um, I need to look at it again, I'm sorry. That's okay, I got it, I got it. Uh, it's, not, it's 124. Here we go, I already got it written down. Let's go here. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Let's go here, all right? Yeah, because I just already wrote this down with Damien, okay? So it's 124.32 micrograms per liter for X bar. S is 37.74 micrograms per liter and N is equal to 52. And then the null hypothesis is 35 micrograms per liter. So that's X bar minus B sub zero S divided by square root of N. And this is what it looks like when you type it into our studio, okay? Yes. Oh, that was another, th that was another thing that I was really struggling with. Um, I saw the mu to the zero and was like does that mean some sort of sample that we're looking at or is it that is the purported population you get it from the reason the null or uh, the the subscript zero is because they're saying it comes from the null okay this value right here is mu sub zero okay so the idea is those both have sub zeros in them, so they're connected to each other, okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so if we go over into our studio now, and we open up a chunk and we type that in, that's what it's gonna look like right there. I call it T observed or TOBS, so I can get back and I can grab that number again when I need it. Cool. So if I run this, this chunk, okay, what it gives me back is my T observed is 17.066666, okay? So remember- so Another question, why is there a zero below that? I'm gonna get there, give me a sec. Oh, sorry. <laughs> me, I promise you, I will do it. <laughs> but so here's the thing, let's, let's go back to the whiteboard for just a second here, okay? Yes. So what this number came out to be, all right, wrong part of the pen, let's get the right side of the pen down here. This number basically came out to be equal to 17, okay? 
So if you think about that in terms of the T distribution, and the Z distribution being, you know, pretty much the exact same thing, they're kissing cousins to each other. Remember that within one standard deviation of, of the mean of zero, I have 68% of the data roughly, right? Yes. And within two standard deviations of the mean, I have roughly what? 95% of the data, right? And then within three standard deviations of the means, I have 99.7% of the data, right? Well, where am I with this particular bad boy? Well, I am way the heck over here in Cleveland. I'm out here at 17 standard deviations because that's what this number is. That's the standard error, which is the measurement of standard deviation, the sampling distribution of X bar in our case, okay? Right. So that's how many standard deviations I am away from the purported mean. In other words, 124.32 is 17 standard errors, which is, remember, that's a measurement of variability from 35. Okay. So, okay, so how much area is there left past that point? Uh, wouldn't it be effectively zero? The crowd goes crazy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Good job, Catherine. Yes, it would be effectively zero. Yes, it would be, because there's like no area left. Okay, so let's see if you can answer the question then. Why is that number zero? That's the p-value. Because it's so far away from yeah, the mean. There's no area left to be cast. It's, it is not exactly equal to zero, but it's, it's just infinitesimally small. You got it. It's beyond ours ability to even display the number to you. It's so small. It's saying, you know what? Uh, no, I'm punting here. It, we're going with zero. That's so stinking small. We'll just say it's zero. Okay. And so what that tells us is that we have a huge test statistic, which means the p-value is about zero. That's what I wrote right below it. So our decision is gonna to be to reject the null hypotheses. And so the conclusion, so that's part D of the problem. They say they wanna know what the answer is in English. It says, based on your preceding result and calculation, oh wait, that, that's not, um, I didn't write the conclusion, I apologize. So. I was working on this earlier to, to post and I guess I didn't get that far. So what would our conclusion be here? There appears to be a significant increase in lead levels in police officers in urban areas. Because remember these guys, the, the, the population of interest is police officers in urban areas. Yeah. Now, would we want to specify police officers in this sample size? I mean, in this particular sample? Well, we're, if we go back up, we did that when we created the null and the alternate, that's when we actually considered that. Oh, okay. That's, that's the point when you bring that into consideration. So it's, they're interested in whether the car exhaust, so they took a sample of 52 police officers subjected to this constant inhalation of automobile exhaust fumes while working in traffic enforcement. So they didn't, in primarily urban environment, they didn't tell us if they randomly selected all 52 from one urban environment. You're hopeful that they were you know, better about that and they, they did a, a nice random sample of maybe multiple urban areas. Um, and, you know, not all just from one city because it could be something that's just particular to one city. And then that would not be representative of all urban police officers that work you know, in traffic enforcement. Yeah. So we don't have that information. We're gonna have to assume that, that that's what they did, okay? It's, yeah. it's the problem with, with textbook problems, you know. It, it, you, you don't have, you, you have to make a lot of assumptions because you don't have all the information. Yeah. 
So the last thing they wanted from us here was based on the preceding result without performing a calculation with a 99% confidence interval for average blood concentration level police officers contain 35 micrograms per liter. Okay, so you have to think about it this way, that, that you're gonna, how are you gonna calculate the confidence interval? Well, it's gonna be centered about mu, isn't it, right? Yeah. And then at a 99% level, let's say we know three standard deviations is 99.7. So just off the cuff, we're roughly going out three standard deviations either side of the mean, aren't we? Yes. So 124, right? Right. Right. And then we would have to subtract three times, what was the number? 37. Right. 0.4 milligrams. And then, uh, well, it's not 37.74. It's 37.74 divided by the square root of 52. So it's, it's quite a bit smaller than that. And so the, the number of standard deviations that we move out after three, that number is going to be something like 120. Right. Okay. So this is all just, you know, thinking about it realistically. But you don't even really need that. You know, based upon what you did with that 17 standard deviations is how far away 35 is from the true population value, right? Or right. from our observed value, excuse me that that hypothesized value of 35 is basically 17 standard errors away from it. So no, 99% isn't going to cover it. You would need 100%, and even then you probably <laughs> wouldn't cover it. Okay. Is that, is that okay? I, th I think it will be once I um, watch this again and... Okay. Um, Worst case, ignore the about doing the calculations and do the calculation. Create the confidence interval and is 35 contained within it, okay? Yeah. I mean, you can always do that. You don't have to, you know. They're trying to get you to do it to see if you really understand what the confidence interval, it, more importantly, what the test statistic is telling you. But that said, just, just you can do the calculation. Yeah. I probably would ignore that and do it myself if I was taking the class. So. Okay. okay, any other ones that I can help you with? We got about 10 minutes left. Oh, dang it. Um, let's see. Exit full screen. And... Um, any ones from the homework in particular? Let's see. How about the one before it, fueleconomy.gov? Uh, 5.8? Yes, fuel efficiency of a Prius. Right, yes. Okay, so the, the official government source for fuel economy information allows users to share gas mileage information on their vehicles, the histogram below shows the sample mean is 35. Let me go ahead and get that problem up here so it's going to be easier because we need the we need the histogram. So that's 5.8, correct? Yes. Okay, let me just a sec here. 518, 513, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. There we go, 5.8. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move the book over where we can see it on the screen. I have two monitors going in, so I would head it over in the other monitor, so. All right, there we go. All right, so the economy.gov, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the histogram below shows the distribution of gas mileages in miles per gallon from 14 users who drive 2012 Toyota Prius. The sample mean is 53.3 miles per gallon and standard deviations of 5.2 miles per gallon. Note that these data are user estimates since the source data cannot be verified for the accuracy of these estimates are not guaranteed, okay? So these were not done scientifically is what they're saying. This is no scientific method where they were controlled. These are just what people reported, but nonetheless, they're probably usable numbers, all right? We would like to use these data to evaluate the average gas mileage for all 2012 Prius drivers. Do you think this is reasonable? Why or why not? Would you answer on that? Well, 
I guess I wasn't kind I kind of wasn't sure um, whether it would be reasonable because they said that um, it wouldn't be accurate. Yes. So you, you, you would say it's probably not the way to do it. Okay. And it's, we were just starting to say that. I mean, we kind of sort of, I've sort of preempted it with their, their thing about note that these estimates are from, or, and source data cannot be verified. So it's probably not the, the best way to do this. I mean, the best way to do this obviously would be to do this on a closed course, a closed track, where you took a random sample of 14 cars, let's say, because that's what they say, our data sets 14, right? And went out and, and drove the cars on the, on the same course and then got that. So you were comparing apples to apples, right? Yeah. And, you know, so it's probably not the best idea, okay? So it's, it, we can do it, but I would not, let's put it this way, I would not publish it. Right. I wouldn't be using this. I wouldn't be putting in the headlines. Oh, Toyota overestimates their mileage or underestimates their mileage based on user input. I mean, that, no. Nah. Wouldn't, wouldn't put it in a scientific journal. No. Peer reviewed journal would kick this back in a heartbeat, okay? <laughs> yeah. It's like, nah, your data sucks. You need to do this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the EPA claims that a 2012 Prius gets 50 miles to the gallon city and highway mileage combined. Do these data provide strong evidence against this estimate for drivers who participated on fueleconomy.gov? Note, note any assumptions that must make uh, as you're proceeding with the test. Okay, so the first assumption is the independence clause. This is definitely way less than 10% of all the Prius drivers, okay? There's way more than, than 14 of them out there on the road. So we've got the independence clause. We're not violating that. Um, whether the distribution is approximately normal, well, I mean, we got, you know, approximately normal distribution from the histogram, right? Right. So we, even though our sample size is small, we can probably be, you know, reasonably assured that um, that, that, that it's a, a distribution is, is approximately normal. So the, using the T distribution here is warranted, okay, from, from that standpoint. With all, of course, the caveat, what we said in the previous problem about um, the quality of the data, right? Right. Okay. So what they want us to do is basically, um, you know, when they say does it provide strong evidence against, against this estimate, well, that's a hypothesis test. That's what they're saying. It's another way of saying it. They say, is the data statistically significant? Does it provide strong evidence against the null? You know, those sort of things. Yeah. They're not going to use the word null here. I mean, but the null is, is that the average mileage is, as the EPA says, which is 50 miles per gallon. The um, alternate, since they didn't really tell us which way they think we want to go, it's not fair to look at the sample number and to set the alternate base on the sample number. Okay. That, that's not a good way of doing it. So since we didn't know up front which way, we whether it would be less than 50 miles per gallon or greater than 50 miles per gallon, we're going to go with the not equals. Yeah. Okay. So if you do that, that's what I've got written here. Okay. That makes sense. I got mu is mu, the null is equal to 50, mu the alternate mu is not equal to 50. Okay. Yes. Those are good? Yes. All right. So we... We discussed, I didn't write it down, but we discussed the assumptions. So we're feeling good about that. So we need to know now what our T observed is. So I, I got lazy here and, for, and didn't uh, echo T ob. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I run this, this cell, okay, what I get is I get two numbers. This first number right here, that's the observed T test statistic. So that's the 53, let's, let's go do this on the whiteboard first before I do this, okay? I think that's a good idea. Let's go write it all down. All right, so what do we got going here? So we know that we're going to calculate the T observed value, right? Which is X bar minus what the mu says of the null divided by S over the square root of N, right? right. So it's how far our sample mean is away from the hypothesized means in units of standard error. So X bar, the sample value, let's go back over here real quick. Sample value was what, 53, 53.3, right? 
Yes. Okay. And the sample standard deviation, they're telling us that that was what, 5.2? Yes. Okay. And these are both in MPG, okay? Yes. And then our sample size, we know that that's equal to 14. And we know that the hypothesized mean, according to our pals at the EPA, was 35. That was the null hypothesis saying that mu is equal to 35, okay? All right, so we come over here and we do the calculation, and so that's 53.3 minus 35, that's what's in the numerator, right? Yes. Divided by parentheses 5.2, which is the uh, sample standard deviation, divided by SQRT of 14. Yes. All right, so that's what we're going to enter into R to get back that calculation. So take a look. That's what I got going right here. Yes. That's that number, okay? And so that's our T observed. And so the T observed is 2.3745, which, you know, that's getting close to um, three standard deviations, like two, roughly two and a half standard deviations if we round off, you know, grossly. So that means, you know, it's, it's fairly far away from, from the sample mean. Now, this is a two-sided test. So let's go back and actually draw what our p-value would look like here, all right? All right. So to draw what our p-value is gonna look like, here's our, our t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to 13. And we know we're centered at zero. And our t observed, the observed value was 2.3745. We'll just go 2.4, okay? So 2.4 would be roughly about there. Yes. All right, so since the alternate hypotheses Hi, Mom. Was that the mean was not equal to 35? Then that means we've got to use a two-tailed test. Uh, um, can I talk to you about it later? In at 9 o'clock, maybe? Five more minutes and we'll be done. Oh. Tell Mom I'm, five minutes and we're finished. How about in five minutes? Okay, all right? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna shade in the p-value, all right? This is a two-tailed two -tailed test. You gotta take that p-value, that area that you found over here, right? Whatever that was, and you gotta double it. Yeah. All right, so the way you calculate that is by using PT. So if I use PT, I got to put in 2.4, which is the number, right? That's my value. And I got to put in my degrees of freedom, which is 13. Now, unfortunately, if I put that number in right there, right? What it's going to give me is this. Because remember, you it's like- You got to take one away from it. You got it. Because it's like everything else in, in the world of probabilities, it's always the left tail that it adds it up to, okay? So yeah, I got to take one minus that. And what one, I do one minus that, and what that's going to give me is it's going to give me now, it's going to give me that red area, okay? It'll give me that was, part right there. I was trying to remember how that command went. That's yeah. good. Okay, now, notice since it's a two-tailed test, though, I've only given you half of the area, right? You follow me? Right. Look, I only gave you this, okay? And since it's yeah. a two-tailed test, I got to double it because I also have to add in that part of it too. So the p-value is both those pieces. It's this piece right here, and it's that piece right there. It's both of those combined, okay? Yeah. So to, to get that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go two times. I got to put the star in there. It won't work. One minus pt, 2.4 by 13, close parentheses, close parentheses. And that will give me back my p-value. Okay, so let's go check that out and see what it gives. That's what the 0 0.0366511, et cetera, is. Right. 
Okay, now I cheated. Instead of doing one minus, <laughs> if this number up here was 2.4, right? And we're symmetric about zero, what's that number right there going to be? 2.4? It's negative. Neg negative 2.4. Yeah. Okay, so notice, see what I did? I mean, that's kind of kind of schlemy of me, but I'm lazy, all right? So instead of doing the one minus, I just put in the negative one, got the area to the left, you following me? I and then so doubled so. it. But here, this, just to prove to you that I'm not lying to you, My bad, yeah, I got it, PT. See, same number. I ran it again, I'll run it one more time, so I'll run all of it, I'll run all of it. Notice I got the same number twice. So either way I calculate it, I'm gonna get back the same value. Okay. All right, so let's let's call it good there. Our conclusion would be at the 5% level would be to reject the null hypothesis because our p-value is small. So you asked me earlier, and I kind of blew you off because I got to get that standard deviation question done, is what constitutes a small p-value? So what constitutes a small p-value is if it's less than 5%, okay? Right. You can take that to the bank. That is that's the gold standard. It's what pretty much all practicing researchers use is, is the 5% level significance. Cool. All right. Okay. Okay. So Catherine, please do not be shy about posting questions up to the Q and a form on any of the rest of the homework problems. And I'll be happy to type them up, particularly the code. I'm happy to share code. If you're having trouble, don't let our studio stop you. All right. It's okay. I mean, if you're understanding it, but you can't get R to do it, Hey, I'm, I'm there for you. Just tell me and I will, I will kick the code down to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, cool. All righty then. So let's call it good. You got to go talk to mom and I yeah. got to get some other stuff done. So you have a great evening. Okay. Yeah, you too. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay.